it's nice to see such a crowd. Um, I would have thought with all the hype and uh, noise and, and seminars that have been around GDPR already that, uh, that everybody would be co completely fatigued and nobody would want to come. But it's good to see you guys are here. I also I do speak so many so often on this kind of subject and usually I might see a whole bunch of familiar faces in the room because it's all the same people in the same circle. It's nice to good to, it's good to see some different faces today. Um, I'm here on behalf of JLink. JLink, the good data company. I'll explain more why we think it's that later on. Uh, we're a West Coast startup, West Coast of the States that is, not Scotland or anywhere else. Um, I'm based here in London. Uh, it's a small, tightly focused, perfectly formed team uh, and we're just about ready to get going with a product we think is going to really help the Salesforce community and more important citizens around the management of data, personal data. But I'm going to get into all of that. Uh, for my sins, I also sit on the International Standards Committee for Blockchain and Distributed Ledger Technology, which is pretty fun because I get to see all kinds of interesting stuff from the Russians and Chinese and Koreans. Um, and I sit on the board of the Open Identity Exchanges Forum on Blockchain and Distributed Ledger, Ledger Technology. And then I have a role on a few other uh, startups on their boards, helping them with go-to-market strategies and that kind of thing. So I have a pretty fun time these days. That's enough about me. What am I going to cover today? Uh, three things, really. I want to talk a little bit about trust. I think it's important. In fact, I think it's the most important thing out there right now with fake news and everything else that's out there. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit how the regulators have responded to what I think is a fundamental lack of trust. And there's lots of other reasons why they're doing it, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, there's an app for that. That's why we're all here, right? So I've got to cover that. There are quite a lot of slides, and I'm going to move fairly quickly. Um, usually, I'd say shout out questions. I don't mind. I don't care. And if there's a burning question, please do shout it out. But I'll probably try to leave a little bit of time at the end to cover that. I'm around for the rest of the day, and so are my colleagues from JLink. So if there are questions, plenty of time to follow up. So um, I think we're heading towards a data economy 2.0. Uh, there, is, there is already an economy in, in information full stop, let alone personal information. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, huge opportunities here, huge opportunities to make a difference both to society and to businesses. Um, and the, that's driven really by this fundamentally easier access to data. It's easier to find out who's doing what, what we care about, what, what we're browsing for. Um, and there's been very little control over all that. And I think that that is about to change. And I think there needs to be a bit of balance uh, between the easy access to data and the risks and threats around that, which I'm going to cover uh, in a minute. But I, but I do like the cover of The Economist there, where it still surprises me that data is more valuable than oil, which, <laughs> when you start to think about it, it becomes obvious, but it still makes me sit back and think a little bit. This is also true. So all these leading magazines, they, it was great they started writing about privacy. Well, I spent probably 14 years of my career doing nobody cared a thing about it at all, and now everybody's writing about it. So um, this particular uh, cover is saying your data is for sale, everything about you being, is being tracked, get over it. And that was a real theme for a long time. But even the famous Mark Zuckerberg said, nobody cares about privacy, that's over, everyone wants to share everything. Which is very interesting because he, a journalist asked him, uh, he'd recently bought a house. I can't remember exactly where he lives, it might be Seattle, but anyway, in America somewhere, and he bought this great big house, spent a lot of money on it, and then he spent at least double that buying the two houses either side. When the journalist asked what was going on there, he said, well, I want some privacy for my family. The fundamental thing he thinks we all don't care about, he's actually really uh, motivated by. And so I'm, I don't really prescribe to this. I think there are no trust relationships, and this is a real problem. So you can do all the profiling and tracking you want, but you don't know if that's quality data. You don't even know if the person you think you're tracking is the person you're actually tracking because of the way computers are shared and everything else. But even if you do that, you don't know these three things. And you need these two things if you want to sell to people. What are they thinking? What do they really want? What do they intend to do? If you can get into that, then you're going to be able to sell much more effectively. But all these practices out there at the moment, they don't, they don't do that. They don't touch it. So if we think that trust is a problem, and you might disagree with me on that, but if we think that trust is a problem, then what builds trust? I like this quote. It's long. And I'm not going to read it all out to you. You can read it yourselves. But um, Jody from the... Um, I think it's the uh, Advertising and Digital Standard, Digital Marketing and Advertising Association. I think that's what it is, something like that. But she's a very insightful um, person. 
And she's got this great view that it's not just about brand. Building a great brand is brilliant, it's really important, but brand in itself doesn't build trust. What we get down to is what you're doing with people's data. And I think it's brilliant coming from a marketing person who normally, you know, their job is to get the message out there to everybody they can, and they're measured on number of clicks or eyeballs or whatever the measures are these days. But for her to start saying, actually, it's about what we're doing with this data and how we're interacting with people, that's what builds trust and trust is important. I think, I think we're starting to see a tide turn. This is a study, I like some of the results in this study, it's from Columbia Business School. It's, I think it runs to 98 pages and it's on the web if anybody wants to find it. Um, I certainly didn't read all 98 pages, but there are some bits in it that are really, really interesting. And they've got this um, little concept here of what's in the mindset of consumers at the moment about sharing data. And the, most people are up in this top left-hand corner here where the scales are not happy to share and um, how defensive they are in their, uh, in their actions around data. And most people are not happy to share and highly defensive. So the number of ad blockers on mobile platforms has just gone through the roof. Uh, and, and that's all because they don't trust what people are going to be doing with their data. So only a quarter of people are in this position where they're in control. They're happy to share, but they're defensive. So they know what they're sharing, and they're, they're giving certain data away for certain reasons. We've still got a few people down in this happy-go-lucky where they're, they're happy to share anything, and they, and they really don't want to defend it. I, I think that's, that, if Mark Zuckerberg's to be believed, that should be 90%, and of course it's not. Um, so I think citizens are starting to get the issues around personal data. And later on in this study, I think we're up to page 89 by this point, um, the, they give some advice. So they do a lot of study, do a lot of uh, surveys, and then they come up to some conclusions. And the two main conclusions that jumped at me were, you have to, businesses have to be, um, invest in building data and consumer trust. That's number one. And the way to do that is by giving customers value in exchange for their data and control of their data. Now, if you talk to some of, certainly the internet giants, they'd say they're already giving value. You've got a free email account. You can share your photos with your friends. I personally don't believe that's really enough value right now, and I think citizens are starting to understand that too. So, <clears throat> what they think you should be doing about this is, is they've analyzed the ways in which you can exchange value and how, what difference that's going to make. And they're coming up with some conclusions around uh, its financial benefits that m create the, the most propensity to share data. Uh, and um, direct rather than indirect. So anything you can do directly with the consumer at the time that they're interested or making a purchase or whatever is far greater than some indirect uh, offer or anything that's experiential um, rather than, so you get a new feature rather than getting some money back or getting a coupon. But I think they're quite nice, they're quite nice insights and please you know, get the reference off me or it's not difficult to find Columbia Business School and Building Trust. Some numbers. Uh, I could have picked any numbers, right? There's enough out there, there's enough studies. But the point with this is the opportunity, if we get this right, or for the companies that do get this right, is absolutely massive. This is actually an old number. I think it's nearly two years old now, maybe three, from Cisco. Uh, $19 trillion to be unlocked by the Internet of Everything. The Internet of Everything totally fundamentally relies on data and moving data around and the concept of identity and the information that attaches to that identity. Um, and then LSE, um, London School of Economics, did this study again a little while ago now, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, over a trillion dollars of value in personal data in Europe. I think that's well, well underestimated. I think it's much more than that. But the trillion will do, right? It's not like it's a small number. Um, and companies that have focused on data have, are very, very valuable right now. I think it's three of the top six uh, companies on the uh, US stock exchange are data-driven companies. Uh, Facebook with 445 billion. I think Google's worth um, 580, and Amazon was 427 billion. These are, these are gigantic numbers, and it's all based on data that consumers are starting to think, ah, I'm not so sure I want you to have that. Okay, so we're, we're, we're setting a bit of a picture here. Great opportunity, but you've got to recognize there are risks. Again, the list of data breaches is as long as, well, much longer than my arms these days. Uh, huge amounts of data being lost. Every week there's a new breach, probably even every day right now. Uh, and these are, these are staggering numbers, and there's been no real consequences up until now. I don't think any of these, pe these companies are out of business. River City Media might be, actually. They were like in the inners of um, email marketing and that kind of stuff. They're probably not a name anybody's heard of. I think they might have gone out of business. But, but again, this is going to change. Regulators are looking at this and saying it, it can't carry on. This is a study by, done by the um, World Federation of Advertisers. 
So I'm trying to stay from the lawyers and all the people who normally talk about privacy. Uh, and they did a study with their, um, their members. And this is what it came back, the answer to the question, what are the biggest risks around GDPR? And everybody talks about the 4% fine, 4% of global turnover, and that's not insignificant. But actually, what companies care most about? Reputational damage, loss of trust, and impact on brand perception. And the reason is those top line impacts far outweigh any financial penalty and probably outweigh the costs of rectifying all the problems you've got if you've lost a lot of data. So it's very interesting that um, there's a whole maturity around this. And I want to change track a bit now and get down into privacy because it's probably why you all came to the session to know about privacy and, and what you can do about um, complying uh, through Salesforce. So there's many definitions of privacy. It's, it's not even clear exactly what we mean by it. There's no one single de definition. I've put a few up here. Alan Weston is a professor. I think he's not with us anymore, unfortunately. But um, back in the 60s, he came up with some definitions around privacy. And you know, about claims of individuals, talks about rights. Even back then, he pointed out that people change their mind on privacy. So just because I gave my data away once doesn't mean I want it to be given away all, uh, all the rest of the time. And even the, the, uh, the American Institute of Certified Accountants get in, get in on the game and, and give a definition there as well. So this is a hard thing to manage because we're not quite sure what it is. It feels a bit, um, a bit touchy-feely. Uh, but what, what, what it really comes down to, in my view, is um, people. And, and there's only a problem with privacy when you do some harm to an individual. And these are generally the four categories of harm that people think about when they're talking about privacy. You know, is it are you being too intrusive? Are you collecting too much data? Are you processing it in ways you shouldn't be processing it? And um, are you l l sending it to parties or letting it um, be exposed to parties that you shouldn't? If you, can, if you can make sure you're not doing those things, then there's very little likelihood you can end up in too much trouble. Uh, now, we talked, to, I talked a bit before about the regulators are responding. Uh, now, why do we need another law? There was already a, a pretty good privacy law in Europe called the, uh, the Data Protection Directive. But this quote from Vivian Redding, who was the commissioner when the whole GDPR thing got written, she's not anymore. But it's interesting to think about this, that when, when the last law came in in 95, and I was around there, that's kind of when I started in privacy, actually, 1% um, of the population was using the internet. That's incredible. It doesn't seem like that long ago to me. And, of course, Mark Zuckerberg, again, was just 11. Uh, and so much has changed since then. And, of course, we need a new law. It, it can't keep up. Even the law that's written now, I would argue, probably isn't keeping up. Um, there's quite a lot that's different, though. Even though there was a law there already, there, I'm not going to go through all these. This is not a teach you GDPR session. Um, but there are some things that are worth picking out here. Um, it, it is applicable worldwide, so the top left there. They really wanted to make sure that anybody processing European citizens' data was caught by this law, no matter where they were based in the world. Um, there are big fines, yes, of course. Uh, certain types of companies have to report a data privacy officer. That person has to be qualified. They have to have a direct reporting line to the board. Um, all kinds of restrictions around that. That's going to be a challenge. Um, breach notification. If, if something goes wrong, you've got 72 hours to notify the regulator. That needs processes behind it. It probably needs automation, frankly, in big, ugly, complicated businesses. Um, and there are some others down here. I want to touch on extra rights in a minute, but the, we need to think about privacy by design, build it into our new processes or our systems. We need to be assessing the impact on privacy every time we make a change. Uh, and these are regulatory requirements. A regulator can drop in and see whether you've done these things. Uh, and that really goes to this accountability principle, which is you need to demonstrate what you've done, not just talk about what you've done to comply with, with the privacy legislation. And of course, right in the middle here, we've got consent, which everybody talks about all the time. But the, the legislation is just one small piece of it is consent. There is a lot else in there. And what are organizations doing, really? The number one thing is training. And, and I, I'm glad about that, because the more people understand when they're dealing with personal data and what that means and the risks there could be, the more likely they are to do the right thing. So training is the number one. But number two did actually surprise me, invest in technology. People have realized that this is not something that can be managed by manual processes and just throwing extra bodies at it. If we're going to manage privacy properly in today's world, we've got to have automated solutions. Right down there at the bottom, by the way, uh, is ceasing to do business with European citizens. Not a great strategy, I'd argue, but 1% of people think that's how they're going to do it. <laughs> Wouldn't be my choice. All right, so we've got problems. Right, I'm not going to focus on this slide at all. There are lots of people. This is Forbes. I think this is some security organization doing studies and surveys. And, and basically, it always comes back. It's too complicated. There's too much to read. I don't understand it. It's not transparent. 
So what, what's out there at the moment for work managing privacy and helping citizens understand and engage, it doesn't work and things have got to change. <coughs> now, why is this consent thing so hard? Well, again, some quotes um, from the actual GDPR, which tries to summarize what consent means, but it, it's got informed, specific, unim, unim, unambiguous, a specific, um, a clear affirmative action. So you can't have pre-tick boxes anymore. There, there are some pretty big things that wrapped up in that little statement there. And then some guidance says, we, you know, we really think this should be done properly. However, it can only be lawful uh, if it's a genuine choice. So what happens if the user doesn't want to give you their address? A um, bit difficult if you're Amazon and you want to deliver things, I get it. But there are other categories of data that they might want to withhold and only give you the basics. Well, you've, that's got to be OK. Otherwise, consent is no longer lawful for your business. You've got to try and find some other lawful basis for having that information. So. I did promise we'd get on to some kind of solution, not all bad news, you know, we're here to help. Uh, so we have, oh, I forget exactly when, was it just before Christmas, Jim? I know the CEO's in here somewhere. We actually had uh, our app approved and it's in the Salesforce app store now. You can all search on it, we'll be checking, see how many people have looked it up. Um, and it offers uh, synced contact data managed by the citizen for a dollar a year per citizen. Um, we think that's a pretty good, pretty good deal, frankly, when we talk about value exchange. But what does that mean? Let me, you know, I'm going to come on to this more. So, so there are some hard bits in here for, co for companies around the GDPR, and, and these tend to be the ones that are quoted the most. The c new citizens run. Actually, they're not new. Some of them are new. Um, some of them have already been there, like access to data, um, understanding how the data is processed, the right to correct it. They've all been around for a long time. Receiving a copy of the data in a format I can give it to somebody else, that's new. So that basically means you have to be able to give the data to your competitors if the citizen wants you to. That's what that means. And you can't say no. It's the law. Um, and then we get data erasure of data, classically known as the right to be forgotten. Yeah, if a, if a customer, there are some certain circumstances around it, but, but they're quite broad. If a customer says, I don't want you to hold any more data on me or that data for any longer, you have to comply. You have to prove that you complied. Quite hard to do, frankly, with the way data spreads around organizations these days. And then there's some more here about objections and restricting. So giving quite fine granular control over data to citizens. And most businesses I know, and some of them are working on this for three years or more now, they're still not ready for this. This is hard. We've had lots of presentations today about all these massive number of systems that keep springing up for using data, and a lot of them add value. But they make this much more difficult. <coughs> And this one's interesting. This, I think, is going to get a lot of attention. The, the, the concept that you can require a human to be involved in a decision-making process. The whole world has tried to move to an automated process and automated decisions because that's quicker and more efficient and we can make more money that way. The law is actually winding that back a bit, saying, you know, if you're getting a mortgage or, or a health insurance kind of uh, decision, you can insist that some human has looked at that. It's just not an automated decision. So the computer says, no, it can't be the final answer anymore. Um, and there's some other things, not just about the rights, but um, to exercise the rights. Some of these things are tricky as well. So they can contact the company, but who do they go to? And how do you tell them who to contact? If you've got a data privacy office, that would be the obvious place um, to go to. But you've still got to get that message to your, to your citizens. Uh, the company must respond without undue delay, one of those great woolly phrases, but they do qualify a bit by saying at least within a month. Sounds like a long time, but it's not when the subject actual request, where's all the data on this person? How can I get it together in the right form that they can understand? How can I get it to them and make sure they've got it all within 30 days? But that takes some doing. Um, the good news, if there is any for, here for companies, but the good news is that you can actually ask a citizen to confirm their identity. So you can go through a basic validation check to make sure it's not just some random request from troublemakers. But it's not much of an upside, I agree. So what does Jaylink do about all that then? So what we've built... Uh, what well, the team have built, I should say, because I didn't build much of it, I can assure you, I'm not a coder. Um, but what we've built is a, a tool that enables the management and sharing of trusted data. I come back to that original thing. We've got to get trust back into the equation over the internet. So it operates at internet scale, that's important. Unless it can do that, it's not really going to be a solution. So we've got these APIs, you know, they can just be called direct. Um, uh, clearly, we've got an app in Salesforce that does that, it creates that connection. Other businesses who aren't on Salesforce can use the APIs. Um, it creates these automated agreements. So there is an automated signed agreement signed by both the company and the citizen about what data you've got on them and what you're allowed to do with it. And there's no argument. There's a copy on both sides. So that helps a lot in, in case there are any disputes. 
Um, there's provenance. So there is a cryptographic key mechanism. It's getting a bit technical. I don't want you to glaze over, and I might if I go much further into it. But the, we, there are cryptographic elements in here that make sure you've got some confidence it's that citizen. So it solves that problem I was talking about before, about verifying the identity of who's making these requests. Um, and it's game changing. We're here to talk about personal information and GDPR. But when we think about the Internet of Things and devices and sensors, I don't know, sensors in a nuclear power station talking to a command console, how do they know the data is coming from the actual sensor? You know, so there are other uses of this technology rather than just personal data, but that's probably not what we're going to be doing with it in Salesforce. And what does it look like? Well, of course, we had to make something that works on a, on a phone. Um, I don't think we're intending to point any particular phone provider here, but it's the nice pictures. Uh, so what we're trying to do is say the users should be able to manage their data. That's the primary point. So we have all these categories of data, find your own control, nice, easy, recognizable interface, on, off. I'm sharing it or I'm not. But actually, we want to make sure we engage the publishers. So people need to get information to citizens, and citizens need to receive information so they can get things they want. So that's OK. You know, we can say, what, what are you interested in? What are you happy to receive adverts about? That's all built in there as well. And then we've got brands. Uh, and this is where it starts to get hard. So most people here, I imagine, are working inside a company. And most companies think, how do I manage my customer? And how do I manage my business? But actually, the real problem is how do citizens manage 10, 100, 1,000 brands. And at the moment, we seem to be heading down a, a, a potential for just creating many more silos with much more granular and fine-grained words on the website. But if you think, step back and think of us as citizens, that means we're going to have to go to 100 different websites and go through that process 100 times. That's going to be really painful. It's probably not going to make you feel like buying much. But this, what we're trying to do with our technology and say there's one place and you can push that data directly to those companies with the permissions attached. I think that's quite rev revolutionary and probably the only way you can really solve this problem. So oh, that hasn't come out very well, has it? Um, you don't need to read all the detail in here. The point is that uh, the, the Alice is a, a cryptographic phrase for the citizen, um, or one end of a communication chain, actually. But she can, she can manage her master data, and she can make calls about what she would like to do across all of her brands. So you can make it really simple and easy up here. And that's pushed to all the brands she in, uh, interacts with. Or you can let her go down to any individual brand. We've got Bobco here, a particular company. And she can go and set very specific permissions that apply to that company only. And what's nice about this is that this, this area here is, is whatever Bobco has chosen to provide granularity over. So things on here, location-based offers, um, age-relevant offers, you know, whatever they might want to do in there in terms of marketing. That's configurable by the company. And over here, what we've got, this is a list of all the, those individually signed agreements. You can click on any one of these and say, what did I do with that, with that brand on what date? You know, have they got my data? Have they not got it? That there's a record of all of that. Um, probably a bit of duplication on this side, but, but this silo problem, I think, is huge. Uh, and we need to manage data as its source. And the source is the citizen. Now, if you can do that, though, managing data at the source means the company has got more up-to-date data that they can rely on came from the right source, rather than having to buy it off lists. And you don't know if you've got the permissions. And you don't know if it's accurate or out of date. So I, I think this has got to be the future. Uh, and what we're trying to do here, it might be hard to pick out on the, on, on the slide, but to make it even easier, we're trying to say, well, actually, probably what an, al an Alice or, or, or would want to do is, is say, I want to exchange certain types of data with retailers. And can you let all the retailers have this kind of categories of data about me? But financial institutions, I might want them to have a separate set of data. So you can, you can select profiles and share data in that way. Uh, I talked about uh, businesses being able to customize. Again, a very simple interface. You know, select what permission type, what use you're, you're asking for. Put some words that are very simple, classic 140 character limit to keep it really simple and transparent. And what pops up in front of the um, citizen then would be whatever you've chosen. So this one is, I want to be able to send them product uh, info and a newsletter. And the citizen can say yes, no to either one. Very, very configurable. There is no one right answer for this. We haven't tried to make it cookie cutter. One size applies to everybody. The other thing we've done with it, though, is also make the ability to solve some of these other hard problems. So not just consent, but things like delete my data. I said before, how's a customer going to get that message, and who do they send it to? Well, actually, if you've got this kind of interface into Salesforce, you can very clearly turn that on, 
get a message saying you're sure, basically. And if you click that, what actually happens, but it depends how the company wants to configure it, what actually could happen is you will just delete all the data. But probably what should happen is the company sends a message to the privacy officer, maybe the Salesforce account manager as well or something, but you know, again, configurable, and a, and a workflow kicks off that makes sure you're complying with the regulatory deadlines. And we've got other ones in here. Again, this isn't a definitive list, but give me all the data you have on me. That's a right. Um, don't make computerized decisions about me. These words can be changed because everybody will want to interface with their, their customers slightly differently. But building in that direct link to Salesforce and the workflow, I think ultimately what we're trying to do is Jolene plus Salesforce ticks a lot of boxes on, on GDPR. But not only that, it starts to build trust. And I'm very pleased that Cisco jumped on this bandwagon in just this year, actually, January this year. Another great report, if you want to go and look at it. Uh, it's about a privacy maturity benchmark study. And they're saying, if, can we figure out whether companies have got mature processes or immature processes around managing personal data and privacy? And they found that the companies that have more mature processes, so on this side, optimized, it often means automated, um, well, they're saving huge amounts of the cost of responding to a data breach. Quite significant sums. But even better than that, I would say, later on in the report, they get to the impact on sales. And they've done these studies and they've interviewed a whole ton of companies. And those companies that are more mature in their approach to data management, on average, an 80% improvement in delays to sale process. And that could be because of queries over the data or using the wrong data or sending the product to the wrong place. There's many reasons it can go wrong based on bad data. So if we can do this, if we can, if we can get trust back into data, we can certainly do the top two, especially with a technology like Jailing. But I think we're actually starting to get ourselves towards a, a world where we can start to signal our intent. So we don't just get blasted with lots of adverts. We can start to say, do you know what? I want to buy a car in the six, next six months. The last time I bought a car, for the six months after I got, bought a car, I got inundated with adverts. I was never going to buy one. That was completely wasted advertising budget. So I think this might be the future, the next step over. Everybody's focused around here at the moment. Some smart com companies are trying to focus on data quality. And I think the visionary ones are starting to move to this. I think that's pretty much time up. Time up. Thank you. Good stuff.